Hello, lovely internet strangers. For those of you who have not seen it before, this is my Thomas Soul shirt that my husband got me, and I love it. It is amazing. And those of you who do not know who Thomas Soul is, YouTube is your friend, and you're welcome. I recently read a Quillette article titled, Are Contemporary Feminists Too Agreeable? by Louise Perry. It got me thinking about some of these ideas I've mulled over for a while about women and feminism, and I was inspired to try to talk about them a little bit and make them into a kind of more coherent theory, although it's far from that. Now, Louise Perry is a feminist as far as I can tell, but more of an older school feminist, uh, you know, a gender critical feminist, as far as I can tell from her articles and from Twitter. So the main points in her article are that women on average, according to the psychological literature, are higher in agreeableness than men on average. Now, agreeableness being defined as one of the big five factors of personality, and it indicates how averse to conflict you are. So the more agreeable you are, the more you dislike conflict, the more it upsets you emotionally, the more disagreeable you are, the more it doesn't bother you, the more you may even be likely to seek out conflict. Now she makes the case that the landscape for feminism back in the second wave was very different than what we're seeing now, because in the second wave there was essentially a small group of activists who were very vocal. It was not popular to be a feminist, so the women who were in the second wave were largely a sample of the female population population who were more disagreeable than the average woman. However, in the third wave, because it has become okay to call yourself a feminist, because feminist ideas have become mainstream, especially in urban areas, more liberal sectors of the country, declaring yourself a feminist does not make you stick out of the group in any way. You're not likely to encounter conflict by telling someone that you're a feminist. And in fact, in many places, if you declare that you're not a feminist, particularly if you're a woman, people will ask you what's wrong with you, or if they're super aggressive about it, they'll ask you about your internalized misogyny. She's essentially saying that there's very low social cost to being a feminist now, so it has attracted more quote-unquote normal women who are very agreeable, and the problem with agreeableness is, as stated, it makes you averse to conflict. One of her main points is that because of the agreeableness present in many of the women now calling themselves feminists, they are unwilling to essentially carve out what is feminism and what is not, that they have absorbed the priorities of other groups without considering what effects these have on women. Being a feminist is synonymous with being progressive. Intersectionality has taken over feminism. She talks about the fact that because cultural relativism as an idea came to the fore, feminists have absorbed that. Therefore, the feminist movement in at least the West and the US don't concern themselves with the feminist struggles in the Middle East. They'll either say, well, it's their battle and it's not ours, or they may even say, well, we can't really say that their way is, you know, misogynist or against women because it's their culture. Even though feminism originally was founded on the idea of women's rights, and in many Middle Eastern countries, women are denied equal rights to men. However, she makes the point, which I think is quite accurate, that third wave feminists are afraid of being called racist, because most of the people in these Middle Eastern countries that have Sharia law, that deny women equal rights, are brown. So she says, if you're very agreeable, then you want to be seen as nice. You don't want to be seen as problematic. That puts you into conflict with other people, with other people in your group. Taking a stand against other activist groups on the left by saying, no, we're speaking for the interests of women. You can speak for the interests of all these other groups isn't nice. She also talks about the problem of intersectionality insofar as you are unable to punch down. So if you're a cis white woman in the movement, then you are unable essentially to come into conflict with a black woman because she is lower than you in the privilege hierarchy. But in the intersectional hierarchy, that means she has more validity and ability to speak. So if you come into conflict with her, you could be seen as racist. You don't know her experience. Stay in your lane, etc., etc. And she makes the point that second wave feminists were largely disagreeable. They didn't care very much about being nice to those who were not in their movement. Being unpopular was just the way it was because they were a fringe political group. But because that political group is no longer fringe, then there is this agreeableness gap. 
And she sees that one of the effects of this agreeableness gap is that women's own interests have been marginalized within what is supposed to be their political movement. She's largely correct about feminism becoming mainstream, there being lower social cost to becoming a feminist. Any woman will feel comfortable just sort of casually saying they're a feminist without feeling the need to, you know, go march or change anything about her life, you know, to symbolize that she is a feminist. However, I want to touch on the agreeableness part and move into my my sort of theory here that I'd like to lay out, or maybe not a theory, but more of a framework, a lens with which to view what's going on with feminism. When I look at this landscape of the conversation, looking at the feminists, looking at anti-feminists, particularly where we're talking about women, I just see a middle school girl power struggle. I kind of want to talk about this through the lens of a particular movie, which some of you may be familiar with, Mean Girls. Now, Mean Girls takes place in high school. I would say early high school is probably just as bad for these kinds of female behaviors as middle school is. So for those of you who've seen Mean Girls, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have not, let me break things down a little bit. Mean Girls demonstrates how female competition plays out. Now, female competition is largely based around securing male support and attention. However, people get confused because female competition displays itself in arenas that seem to be unrelated to getting male attention, especially because many of these forces are acting on us in ways that we're completely unaware of. But the same as the Red Pill guys talk about high status men and low status men, there are high status women and low status women. So what makes a woman high status generally is a feminine appearance and a feminine personality, because that is what will make her attractive to men. This varies slightly based on culture, based on time period. Obviously, different men have, you know, slightly different preferences. Obviously, what makes a woman high status and desirable in, say, San Francisco is going to be different than what makes a woman high status and desirable in the middle of nowhere in Montana. Wherever you are as a woman, there are qualities that will make you high status or low status, and women are generally pretty aware of what those are. Within that, there are women who are disagreeable and women who are agreeable, somewhere on the spectrum. Essentially, this creates a grid wherein you have women who are high status and disagreeable, women who are high status and agreeable, women who are low status and disagreeable, and women who are low status and agreeable. So when you're looking at the movie Mean Girls, you can see all four of these quadrants. You have Regina George, who is the queen bee. She is high status, but she is very disagreeable. She is not afraid to be seen as a bitch. She is not afraid to stand out from the crowd. She is the one everyone is looking at. She is the trendsetter. She is comfortable manipulating everyone around her. In this movie, the followers are essentially just as beautiful as Regina, which in high school is largely what makes you high status but they're not very disagreeable. They're not willing to stand out from the crowd. They're not willing to be the trendsetter and come into conflict with others. So they end up trying to elevate their status by connecting, by gaining favor with the queen bee. Then there are the girls who you'll see interviewed in the movie who are clearly the loser girls. They're, you know, they're ugly. They don't have the right clothes. They'll say things like, one time Regina punched me in the face. It was awesome. They would love to be Regina's followers, but they're not high status enough to be accepted. So they desperately want to move up the hierarchy, but they can't. No one wants to be alone. And women in particular seem to be very predisposed to needing like social groups and group cohesion. So wherever women fall in the hierarchy, they form their own cliques. So Regina has her clique. These loser girls have their clique. Now, you also see in the movie the character of Janice Ian. I would say that she is low status, but also disagreeable. Janice Ian is essentially a rival to Regina. And the really interesting thing that I think a lot of people miss is that Regina is not the villain of the movie. Janice is essentially no better than Regina. They both have to learn their lesson that this kind of behavior, this kind of female competition is a game that is leading them nowhere. Janice is low status because she's not conventional 
intentionally beautiful. She dresses in a way to make herself stand out, but it does not make her essentially desirable to men, which is a sort of like low level thread that underlies all of this. But she is disagreeable. She's not afraid to have people think she's a lesbian, even though she's not, to talk shit about her behind her back. So she is able to sort of be her own queen bee. And then she has her followers. She has Katie and she has her friend Damien who help her carry out her plan to bring Regina down. The whole movie is essentially a war between these two disagreeable women, these queen bees with their own cliques and followers. And you see throughout the movie all the other sort of like female cliques. There are some, you know, men involved in these cliques, but as you move throughout the lunchroom, you see the different kind of cliques. And then in the end, you see this big scene in the gym where all the cliques are sort of warring as secrets are unveiled. I can't speak to historical feminism as much because it's something I'm still learning a lot about. But what I can say from what I've observed of feminism from the time I entered it until present is that I think what Louise Perry misses is that the conversation is still being dominated by disagreeable women. The agreeable women are not the ones who are dominating the conversation. They are not the queen bees, they are the followers. Whatever sort of doctrine is present in current feminism that is considered sacrosanct law, any of these intersectional ideas that I think Louise Perry sees as, well, it's just because they're afraid to be called racist that they won't stand up against these things. Yes, she is talking about the agreeable women, but the reason that the agreeable women won't push back against these things is because they're falling in line to the queen bees. The queen bees dictate what everyone should think, how everyone should dress, how everyone should act, what you can and cannot say. So in feminism, what you should believe, what makes you a good feminist, a bad feminist. There are disagreeable women at the top who are dictating where the feminist movement is going. Now I think what you see in the anti-feminist movement is very similar to what she's describing in the second wave, that particularly women who would describe themselves anti-feminists or just women who used to be feminists and left it behind, don't use the anti-feminist label, but they're not feminists and they criticize a lot of modern feminists. What you see there is a group of women who are more disagreeable because they have to be, because the mainstream is feminist. For better or for worse, the intersectional feminists have an upper hand in the culture wars. They have the upper hand in academia, in education, as well as in the media. So to be an anti-feminist, is one to use a label that, unlike anti-racist, is opposing something that people inherently associate with good. To be a woman who uses the label anti-feminist is to distance yourself from the group of women. It is to voluntarily cast yourself out of the fold, or at the very least to offer yourself up for scrutiny and questioning, to have people throw slurs at you, to question your own agency, to say you only think like this because of your boyfriend or your husband, because you're stupid, because you don't know anybody, better, because you're confused, because you're evil, if they grant you any agency. So when you see women like Janice Fiamingo, Karen Strawn, Diana Davison, these are women that I completely respect for having the courage to speak out against feminism, to be willing to be smeared and slurred for their beliefs because they feel that it's too important not to speak. All of these women are quite nice people from what I can tell, but the other mistake I think Louise Perry makes in this article is equating agreeableness with being nice. Agreeableness just means how sensitive you are to conflict. So being more sensitive to conflict, being more agreeable, makes you more likely to avoid conflict. However, that does not mean you are nice or good. Hello, passive aggression. Women own that shit. Are you sensitive to conflict, but still have very strong opinions and lots of bitterness and resentment that you would like to weaponize against those around you? passive aggression is for you. So I would disassociate the idea of agreeableness with being nice. So that's my basic idea that there are high status and low status women who are varying degrees of disagreeable and agreeable. That yes, there are more agreeable women in the movement now because it has become mainstreamed. However, the conversation is still being led by the disagreeable women. The women who are willing to stand against them are also disagreeable with the intersection 
intersectional feminists, they're being opposed by the gender critical feminists and the anti feminists. And the intersectional feminists that are leading the movement that are disagreeable are opposing the leaders of the gender critical movement and so on. So it's just a war between queen bees. The agreeable women just get swept along for the ride. They are the followers, they are the drones, the foot soldiers, etc. But they don't realize that that's what they are. A further thought on this is that I think feminism provides a way for low status women who are disagreeable to get power. And then it's very appealing to the low status agreeable women who just think, well, this answers all of my problems. Feminism explains why I can't get a man, a good relationship, why I can't get ahead at work, why my life is so hard, etc, etc. Why I'm constantly being discriminated against. It's because I'm oppressed. There's a patriarchy. Men are trying to keep me down. Everything is sexist. Everything is racist. Everything is homophobic. And you have to point it all out. Anita Sarkeesian, ladies and gentlemen. So I think that there have been some women throughout history that have fought for women to have equal rights under the law who genuinely believe in the equality of men and women as human beings. And that's what they were fighting for. However, I think that much of the feminist movement, definitely from the second wave on, has been about women's discontent and attempts to get power led by the women that are the most disagreeable, dragging along the women who are more agreeable, who have all this bitterness and resentment, but don't have it in their personality to be the ones out there being very vocal and standing against the crowd to lead the conversation. They're just happy to come along once they see that the, the path has been cleared, so to speak. They sort of just follow along as sheep. They're happy to have a group. Women tend to really like having groups. They like forming clubs, book clubs, knitting groups, etc. I hate hanging out in groups of women. <laughs> but most women enjoy that. So I think being a feminist gives them a sense of identity. It gives them a group to belong to, a very big group. You can always find connections that way because you can bond over feminism. You can shit on men together. You can bemoan the patriarchy. You don't have to actually have real conversations with each other or with people who are opposed to your ideology about what are the problems, where do they originate, what can be done about them. Especially when certain solutions that have been proposed by feminists have been tried and they have failed and they call into question the very premises that feminism pushes. There are so many different factions of feminism throughout time and currently the biggest war right now is between the intersectional feminists and the gender critical feminists. And I think if you look at the conversations on Twitter between the leaders or the blog posts that are being written, the articles in the Atlantic and wherever else, Colette, you will see that these are women who are more disagreeable. They are the queen bees, whether they are low status or not. I think feminism, particularly for women who are less feminine, whether it's in their personality or in the way that they look, who get rejected by men, or women who have bad experiences with men, it gives them a tool with which to get power, to exert some kind of revenge. I'm not positing that any of this is happening consciously. Competition derived from evolutionary biological forces is something that happens largely without our conscious awareness, unless you are the kind of person who studies evolutionary biology and then thinks about how they act in their own life. Most of what I see in the feminist landscape today is sort of a middle school girl click power struggle writ large. There's a ton of bullying. There's the cancel culture. There's let's drag this person on Twitter, you know, essentially let's drag them through the digital streets. Let's ostracize them, you know, we'll cancel them. No one can work with them. No one can like anything that they do ever again. If you do, you're bad. That was how girl clicks operated. Each click has its set of ideas that need to be adhered to. Most people, and especially women, and especially feminists, do not want to take personal responsibility, and they do not want to look at their shadow. They do not want to realize the darkness, the ugliness that they're capable of, the bitterness and resentment within their own hearts, and see how they are acting them out. Out. They do not want to believe that they are subject to these forces that they cannot understand from evolution that even if they are a lesbian may still be causing them to act in ways that put them in competition against other women and have them jockeying for power. As we all know, feminism isn't about women. It's about power. Feminism isn't about women. It's about power. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see 
see more, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.